This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. Where did you learn about flying reindeer? What bug frightened Miss Muffet away? Fairy tales and bedtime stories are a cherished part of childhood, and animals are often part of the tale. From pigeons to piggies to a big bad wolf, we go inside outdoors to look at how the animal kingdom helps convey what we cannot. Once Upon a Time is next on Kentucky Afield Radio. You know our patch, but there are some things about the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife you may have never dreamed. For a young mind, every day is an adventure. In schools and in summer camps, we reach 70,000 kids every year, keeping the world a hands-on, minds-on, feet-wet place where nature and knowledge can take root. Kentucky Fish and Wildlife, your partner in the great outdoors. And you thought we were just fishing and hunting. Hunt more at fw.ky.gov. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. You see it as a contribution option when you prepare your state tax return. But you also see it as songbirds and wildflowers. You can see it in clear flowing streams. Sometimes it's so secluded you may never see it at all. But if you only see it on your PC as you prepare your taxes, that's good to you. Google it and see the difference this fund makes. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. The natural tax shelter. This is Charlie Bagman on Kentucky Field Radio. It's funny how make-believe is a part of our daily life, daily productive life. For as rational, for as realistic and factual or educated as we see ourselves, imagination drives the train. It's not just for the artists in the family. It's not just limited to kids. From Star Wars to predicting the outcome of a ball game, buying a lottery ticket, where to go on your next vacation, how's traffic on the way to lunch, fantasy keeps us sane. I bet there's someone in your family with an active, vivid imagination. Maybe that's you yourself. For me... I'm going to give that prize to my wife. She is a first grade teacher, and we will walk into a bookstore. And just like a bee, she shoots straight to the children's section. She picks up a book and instantly becomes the characters, using funny voices the whole bit. She picks up stuffed animals, and they just come to life in her hands, the way she makes them move and look at you. It's magic. Today on Kentucky Field Radio... We talk about how animals enter this picture and how make-believe helps make us what we are. Kathy Mansfield is an expert in early childhood learning. She's my guest from the Kentucky Department of Education, and she's sitting here with a big grin on her face. (laughs) I think you know what I'm saying about the bookstores. You and my husband need to get together. He has the same issues with me. (laughs) Seems like as little children, we begin our learning not through textbooks and hard facts, but through fiction, through stories, through fairy tales. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. That's a child's first introduction to the world around them. They're being read to, and then as they get older and can touch the books and look at the pictures and and start to identify with the characters that are in the books, that's how children first experience the big, beautiful, wonderful world around them. We use a lot of animals, and Kentucky Field is, of course, about nature, wildlife, interactions with the wild world around us. And we take a look around, and it's easy to find Porky Pig and Daffy Duck and Donald Duck and the three little bears and Goldilocks and all of these myriad stories that date back for generations. They're fairy tales, but do we, in the reading of these stories, what do we come away with, a moral Do we come away with a lesson learned? I think all of the above. I think we learn lessons from those books as children. I think we learn facts about animals even. I think sometimes we obtain misconceptions 
about the natural world from those stories. But as children grow and experience more of the world around them, the actual world and actual nature and are introduced to real animals, those misconceptions disappear. Children just naturally have that ability to fantasize, to have their stuffed animal they believe is real and can talk to them and they can uh, talk back to the stuffed animal. They gradually, as they experience more of the world, read about more of the world, interact with more of the world. They recognize that pigs don't walk around wearing clothes and wolves don't dress up like granny. And the bears don't eat porridge from a bowl and sleep in a bed. They don't. But for some reason, it's fun to do that. It's fun to tell a story that they do. I've often wondered why when we know that it's not true. Any idea? Is there something about fantasy that just makes learning easier? Oh, it really does. Here's an example. There's a book, Who Way for Wadney Wat. It's by Helen Lester. It is about a group of rodents. Wadney Watt is a rat named Rodney, but he can't pronounce his R's. Into town, into the school, comes Camilla Capybara. She is a terror. She's a bully. That is a type of book that children can relate to because there are bullies in the world. But it's a different way to learn about how to deal with bullies in the world than to read about a real situation. Um, When there are animals as the characters, I don't want to say it's a lighthearted way to introduce children to real world issues, but it's an inroad to be able to talk about these weighty issues that can insert some humor so that a child is engaged with the story but can learn some really good skills, some strategies to deal with the real world when they encounter it. Almost every child is going to encounter a situation with bullying. Well, that's clever, and it works. As I mentioned, a group of rodents and Camilla Capybara comes in. I had never in my life heard of a capybara. Never seen one, didn't know what one was. But in this book, she's the largest rodent. Well, I got to go to the country of Panama a couple of years ago. Won it on Wheel of Fortune, and my husband and I got to go to Panama. Capybaras live in Panama. Nice. They are the largest rodent in the world. Now, that was a characteristic, a real-life characteristic depicted in this book. She was the largest rodent. They want to be around other capybaras. And those characteristics were characteristics that Helen Lester, the author of the book, embedded into that story. So not only are children able to learn about strategies to deal with bullies, they can subtly pick up on some real information about an animal. I did, and I was an adult. You won it on Wheel of Fortune. Yes. So was this actually on television? Yes. It aired November 23rd, 2012. I Were won. you the winner that night, the overall I win? was. I went to the bonus round and everything. I did won. you win the bonus round? Oh, why did you have to ask that? Because I want to know. I they, did. They seem tough. <laughs> I watch it every night. <laughs> I can't it, get them. Well, you only have 10 seconds, and when all the cameras are on you in the live audience, those 10 seconds fly by fast. I did not answer the bonus question correctly, but I made it to the bonus round. I won um, a little over $22,000 in that on that night, and part of that was an eight-day, seven-night trip for two, all expenses paid to the country of Panama. Nice. I have always had two questions. One, the participants, if they're shouting out, I want to buy an E or the letter R, (laughs) they shout it out. Oh, you're told to do that. You're told to shout. Absolutely. You're on TV, so there's a very tight time schedule. You You can't waste words, waste time. T, you shout it out nice and clear and loud. They want to make sure that you say the letter clearly and loudly, so there's no question about whether you said D or T. You need to pronounce it very clearly, very loudly. And what about why are the contestants always clapping? 
Well, you want to encourage your fellow contestants. It to... seems overkill to me. There's just so much <laughs> clapping. And did, if you're just standing, if there's a dull moment, you're clapping. Uh, you're told to do that. You're told to do that, and it's a natural response. I rolled bankrupt. I spun bankrupt at one point, and there I am, just clapping and <laughs> grinning, just as happy as can be, because I was just excited to be there. One of the things they tell you, you have a, you have coaches, contestant coaches, and um, you have practice sessions. You have spin the wheel practice because the wheel is very heavy, and there's a whole technique yeah. involved. They teach you how to grab a hold of the spikes on the wheel and how to uh, lean your body in, how to do all of that. It's a game. Enjoy it. Enjoy the experience. And I took that to heart. I was just thrilled to be there. You would absolutely have to be. Look, we'll get that link. We'll put that out there on Facebook so folks can watch. We need to take a break. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. Kathleen Taylor, she's a researcher from Oxford, and this goes way back to the 20s, but I think she hit the nail on the head when she said, essentially, knowledge is what helps us deal with the world as it is. Imagination helps us escape it. This is Charlie Baglin on Kentucky Field Radio, and we're back on the topic of putting imagination to work in storybooks for little boys and girls. Cartoons do it, too, for that matter. Bugs Bunny, Yogi Bear, Little Mermaid. Is it wise, or does it taint the picture of what wildlife really is? Kathy Mansfield, for you, since you have taught both in the rural community and in the inner city. Is the big bad wolf seen the same in both places? Um, I do think there's a difference. I taught for 12 years in a couple of inner city schools in Louisville. Here's a great example. I'll come back to the wolf question you had. There was a little boy in second grade. We were reading a book about a cow. It was a fiction book. I don't even remember the name of the book. But in some discussions, he mentioned that he had never seen a cow this child had lived in an area of the city, didn't have those opportunities like I had had growing up to, to go with my mom, driving out through the country and to see those sorts of things. Or what to, impact does and that have on their learning, you think? I think it opens up that opportunity for school librarians. I was a school librarian for 19 years. And in Kentucky, every school is required to have a certified school librarian. I think it opens up that opportunity for teachers and school librarians to bring as many of those experiences to those children so that they learn about cows and other animals in the world around them and recognize that there is a world beyond the world that they currently know and to introduce that in a way that inspires their curiosity so that they want to go and see other parts of nature for real life. And then it opens up that opportunity to help um, provide field trips and other opportunities to bring the world to them or take them to a smaller version of the world. For instance, the State Fair, that same little boy, a couple of years later, we were able as a school to take a trip to the State Fair. And he was able to see a cow and sheep and pigs and all those sorts of things. We were able to provide that as a school system to him and the others who needed those same experiences. Now, when I taught out in Waddy, Kentucky, mm -hmm. a very different story. These, you know, the majority of the kids I taught grew up on farms. They had animals all around them. It, they had they seen it knew, all oh, they had seen more than I had ever seen. And, but it was interesting. You asked about the whole wolf thing with the inner city kids. The characteristics of the wolf. They could really understand those. The wolf was sneaky. The wolf was out to, you know, to get the other animals. It was a predator. And then the kids in the rural setting, they could recognize the actual characteristics of the wolf because they perhaps had seen foxes and coyotes and, and those sorts of things and could relate to the story in a different way. The last thing I'd ever wanted to do is stereotype by saying if you grew up in a city, you don't know anything about the outdoors, and that's not always the case oh, at all. Oh, not, not at all. But I'm curious, in your little field trip that you took to the State Fair, where you could see rabbits or chickens, pigeons, how did they react? Well, 
there were a couple of kids who were a little bit afraid, but because of the other kids around them who would go up and, and venture out to try to pet them, it, that won them over to be able to do the same thing. The joy. Oh, I, I can't even describe the joy these kids had over seeing a real live pig, a real live sheep. It's like for me when I saw the capybara down in Panama. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I probably have a 100 pictures of the same capybara. You were five years old. I all was. Of a sudden, I was. All I had never. The only capybara I'd ever seen was in Huey for Wadney Watt. <laughs> and she was dressed in clothes. And that's the same joy that those children experienced as well. People love fantasy. Go to buy the movies theater. Every picture out there is not a documentary. You know, Star Wars and everything else. I had a list here on the subject of anthropomorphism, big word, but meaning we give human-like traits, characteristics to animals. And we certainly don't just do this for the benefit of children. We will extend anthropomorphism in our real life to things such as the Energizer Buddy, the Michelin Man. We give names to storms like Hurricane Katrina, School mascots, the man in the moon, werewolves, mermaids, the movie cars. We are giving human-like attributes to things that really shouldn't have them. Does that surprise you? That something we're doing with kids, we continue through our life because we like things that are human like us. It makes the world easier to understand. I think you just hit on it right there. It makes the world easier to understand. Even as adults, we still retain that curiosity and desire for the fantastical that we had as a child. That's happened for, you know, centuries upon centuries. You know, societies that didn't know the science behind how things happened would explain it through some fantasy narrative that made you know, sense to them because they didn't know how it happened. And then as we gain knowledge about how the world works around us and new science, we find those explanations. But I think we still hold on to fantastical explanations as well because that just helps us to relate to that world around us in a better way. There's no real life cookie monster. It's only on Sesame Street. The Muppets, Kermit the Frog, plenty of frogs around Kentucky. Is that the best way to learn about animals, to see them interact as if they were human beings? Or should we just keep it blah and say, here are the facts about animals and keep it black and white? Or is there any author out there that's sort of melding the two together? That's much more prevalent now than it used to be years ago, even when I started teaching in 1991. We have lots of what we would call hybrid books. It's hard for a librarian even to categorize them as nonfiction or fiction because it's a blend of the two. I have one with me today, Flight of the Honeybee by Raymond Huber. It's one of the nominees for the 2016 Kentucky Bluegrass Award. In fact, there's several animal books that are on that nomination list. Well, this book is about a little honeybee named Scout. The things that happen to Scout are based on facts about real honeybees. Here's a quick example. A bee the size of a cherry pit crawls from the hive. Her stripes glow golden in the morning sun. Scout has spent her whole life in the crowded hive. Now it is time for her to fly out and explore the world. Time to search for flowers from which to collect pollen and nectar for food. Her sister bees are inside, making honey. But will there be enough? The cold is coming, and Scout must find the last flowers of the fall. That is science. Right. Well, but now the story is fictional. You know, there's not a bee whose you know, mother has named her Scout. But within just that one page, you've heard terms, pollen and nectar, and you've discovered that's something that honeybees eat. It talks about her sister bees. Now, there's a fact that's listed that's not part of the narrative that's in smaller print that's at the bottom of this page. It says, there are about 50,000 female bees in a hive and very few males. The way that's described in the narrative, her sister bees are inside making honey, but will there be enough? So those facts are embedded in that story about Scout and all her sisters.
that's going to work. That will hit home with kids. The facts are also on the same page, and then there's the story. Yes, and that's not in every book, but in this particular one. One more example on page 9. Scout remembers what she passes as she flies, so later she can return home. She knows the sun will guide her, too. Now, a fact on that page says bees navigate using sunlight, landmarks, and smell. They also have a magnetic sense that is like a built-in compass. Now, if you are a first grader, I'm going to read those two again to you, and you tell me which one of those passages is going to resonate more with you as a first grader. Okay, I'm okay. six. Let's You're go. Si- okay. Scout remembers what she passes as she flies, so later she can return home. She knows the sun will guide her, too. Now, did you learn anything from that? That she's trying to keep track of where she's been and mark the way to get home when she's done. Good. Now, here's a different way. Bees navigate using sunlight, landmarks, and smell. They I'm all... already asleep. There you go. But So it's the same information. Yeah. More creatively but... presented. Absolutely. And we as adults appreciate learning that way, too. Why do we go to movies? We like the story, and the story helps us remember. And when a story is laden with facts, historical fiction, for instance. Now, I have a background in social studies. I have a social studies degree. There's a big difference between reading a social studies textbook and reading historical fiction that has factual information about history embedded in the story. I guarantee you I'm going to remember more from that story than I probably would from the textbook. I bet you are every little boy and girl's favorite teacher. Kathy Mansfield is my guest. How Wildlife and Wild Places Come to Life. It's a show for kids and for the kid and all of us. Our fishing report is just ahead. And then back more on the topic in our next half hour. My name is Charlie Baglin. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. We are back on Kentucky Field Radio. This is Charlie Baglin. If you would like to hear this show again or share it on Facebook or send someone the link, pretty easy to do. Go to Facebook and just search Kentucky Field Radio. There you will find the weekly link. Also, as long as you're on the web, you can go to YouTube and put Kentucky Field Radio in the search box. And we are also a podcast on iTunes, so look us up. That simple. This is rocket science. I'd like a Kentucky nature plate. This is not. In fact, a couple turns of a screwdriver is about as complicated as it gets. Sure, the goal behind the nature plate involves ecology and the science of saving scenic places, but all you have to remember is to ask for it when you renew your regular license plate. When you do, you renew Kentucky, too. The Kentucky Nature Plate. Buy it today for Kentucky's tomorrow. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. You see it as a contribution option when you prepare your state tax return. But you also see it as songbirds and wildflowers. You can see it in clear flowing streams. Sometimes it's so secluded you may never see it at all. But if you only see it on your PC as you prepare your taxes, that's good to you. Google it and see the difference this fund makes. Kentucky's Nature and Wildlife Fund. The natural tax shelter. Back in our second half hour on Kentucky Field Radio, my name is Charlie Baglin, in the studio with Kathy Mansfield. And I feel like I should have been starting every segment, Kathy, with Once Upon a Time in a Land Far Away. That triggers our imagination. Animals are certainly a central part of many stories. I have spent my career in advertising. I've given voices to fish and to deer, and I know this much. You have to be creative. But if you want to sell something to a a, a boater, even if it's an idea, farmer or to a mother, you have to speak in a language they understand about a subject they are interested in. If you don't, then you've lost them from the get-go. Wouldn't that have to work the same way with children? Children experience the world around them um, at the beginning of life, up through probably ages four or five, with the idea that their stuffed animals can come to life and talk to them, that animals can walk and talk, and that's common across cultures. And then as children grow... 
and they broaden their experiences. They learn more about what real life is like. And we don't lose that as adults. We, we have those that. fond memories. I still have some stuffed animals from when I was a child that I keep because I have an attachment to them that is beyond explanation. Other adults would um, certainly probably have things from their childhood that they can remember and you know uh, relate to as well. I know that my old teddy bear is not real. But I have memories of when he seemed real to me. I have the same teddy bear in my garage. (laughs) And probably three or four years ago, I was cleaning out the garage, throwing things away. I came across this old bear. Eyes were missing. Fur was matted. And I threw it away. But I said, no, I think I'll keep it. And it's still sitting on my shelf. And every time I see it, I'm three years old again. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with that. It is a common human experience. You have brought with you, Ms. Librarian, (laughs) a bunch of books, a shelf full of books. Through the generations, what have been some of the most popular books? Well, let's go back to the 1800s. Rudyard Kipling In 1894, The Jungle Book was published, and he also published Just So Stories, stories about how the camel got his hump, how the leopard got its spots, how the tiger got its stripes. And those were popular not only with children but with adults as well. But it was a way for children to learn about unique characteristics about different animals. Even with those simple stories, children could learn about animals they might not be able to see readily around them. I remember my grandmother telling me stories in the early 60s about Goldilocks and the Little Red Riding Hood. Now, I don't think those were freshly off the printing press at that time. I don't know how how far back do they go, but that's my earliest recollection. It's almost impossible to trace some of those stories. Now, the Grimm brothers, Wilhelm and Jacob Grimm, wrote down some um, of the different fairy tales and folk tales, gosh, back in the 1700s in Germany where they lived. And that's some of the first written accounts of folk tales and fairy tales that had been around for ages upon ages. Stories back to Aesop. Now, he didn't do fairy tales. He told fables. That's over 2,500 years ago. He lived in ancient Greece, and there's very much the oral tradition of telling the stories. We're not able to trace the original authors of many of those fairy tales and folk tales. It was an oral tradition that was passed down, and now we have multiple versions of those stories. We even have the true story of the three little pigs, which is told from the viewpoint of the wolf. Uh, So we have uh, what we call fractured fairy tales that are a take on those. They've They've been around, they've been a part of our culture, a part of not just American culture, a part of all sorts of cultures, all sorts of societies around the world since time began. But in more modern times, let's take, for example, Bambi. Mm -hmm. Uh, Walt Disney took that story and made a movie out of it. That raises Mm -hmm. a question. Are stories better told through screen, through a child reading the story him or herself, or by being read the story? I would say being read to and reading themselves is going to spur the imagination on more because a child is picturing the scenes in the book, the characters in his or her mind. The dilemma sometimes with a TV show or movie that depicts a book, it takes away that creativity, the imagination part of interacting with the text, of interacting with the book. If we could go just through the decades, again, the best stories that, say, kindergartners or first, second graders may have been reading at that time or being been told. Well, 1941, Curious George was introduced to the world. He's curious about it. Oh, my goodness, isn't he? It's the first book I ever remember learning how to read, Curious George. It is. What is a characteristic about George in this book? And it's in the title. George is? Curious. He's curious. Now, real-life monkeys, would you describe 
them typically as curious creatures? They are, and they're also thieves because they'll come up and steal your purse right off your shoulder. Oh, and that's your cap. right. They're curious. They're mischievous, yeah. and that's a characteristic of real life monkeys that was depicted in the book of Curious George. But George and his adventures. That was a fun way to first of all learn about this a unique characteristic of most monkeys, but it was also a fun way for children to see themselves in the mischievousness of George because they did some of the same things George did. I know I did and got in mess of trouble. It was okay for George to be curious and it should be okay for children to be curious as well. I think that's why Curious George continues to be a popular story today. He's a timeless character, a classic character, but he is very much like an inquisitive child. Can we chat a second about the inventiveness in the animals used by one of who I think is one of the greats, uh, Dr. Seuss. One of the most famous Dr. Seuss books, The Cat in the Hat, came out in the 50s in 1957. But think about the characteristics that this Cat in the Hat depicts in this book. He's mischievous, he's sneaky, and I'm sure some people would describe real-life cats that Mm -hmm. way. Dr. Seuss would create animals, invent animals, such as the Lorax, the Grinch. Mm -hmm. We know these animals don't exist. I don't know what a Lorax is, but there might be a Lorax in the Congo. Does that help me better connect the dots of nature? I think that uh, when we hear about characters like the Lorax or characters like the Sneetches, It helps us to maintain that curiosity about the world around us and to ask those what-if questions and pursue that inquiry that's innate in all of us from the time we're one, two, three years old till the day we die. Hearing about characters that aren't real can sometimes stoke that curiosity, so we want to go out and find out whether they could be real or not. Now, with the Lorax, I have a greater appreciation for trees because of that book. And so Dr. Seuss encouraged us to think about nature, real nature, around us. And he did that by using a make-believe character who helped us understand and want to take care of the real trees that are in our world. What are a few of the other Great books along the way that we have all remembered from school, whatever our age might be. Are You My Mother by P.D. Eastman came out in 1960, and it's all about a little bird who wakes up in her nest, and the mother has gone off to get food, and the little bird is he hatches from the egg. He hadn't hatched yet at the beginning of the story, but he hatches from the egg, and where is my mother? And he goes to look for her, and he asks all these other animals, are you my mother? Are you my mother? And even though it's a pretend story, one of the things that children can pick up on is that for at least the different species depicted yeah. in this book, the mother looks like the child. The child looks like the mother. So you know, when the bird asks the dog, are you my mother? You can see in the picture, you know, he says, I'm not your mother. I'm a dog. And they don't look alike. She asks the cat and the cow. And so even at a very young age, children begin to understand that animal babies often look similar to their mother. So it's a way for children to, to be introduced to that basic concept of nature, but in a fun way. Because a child can relate to wanting to know where their mother is. Yeah. Or who's my mother? Where's my mother? What else she got there that you like? The Pigeon Books, Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus. It was first published in 2003 by Mo Wilhelm. He still produces those books. One of the most recent is The Pigeon Needs a Bath, and there's Don't Let the Pigeon Stay Up Late. Mo Wilhelm's, did he write the Happy Pig Day book, Oinky Oink Oink? Yes. Mm -hmm. That was clever. A pig was talking to an elephant, and the elephant said, well, I can't celebrate happy pig day i'm not a pig i'm an elephant i'm not pink i'm gray i'm huge and you're small the pig said but happy pig day is for anybody who appreciates pigs and he had all his friends standing there who were other pigs but they lifted up their masks and there were foxes under there and rabbits and all types of animals that appreciated pigs 
And it just shows how we don't stop our appreciation at just one thing. Nature is for everybody. That's right. And what a better way to share that message with small children than through make-believe characters that can convey that message in a way that couldn't be conveyed perhaps any other way. Here's a what if. What if we just did away with pretend? Literal was the new law. You had to teach purely facts in a bland and boring kind of way. Instead of bedtime stories, you had to read from a science book or history book. We would have a riot on our hands. We'll spend our final few minutes seeing what clever authors are doing to blend the two. This is Charlie Baglin. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. We are back on Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. Back with our final few minutes with librarian Kathy Mansfield on stories we read to the children in our life that include animals like Chicken Little, Mother Goose. And we know birds don't speak English. But we present it to little boys and girls as if they do. Something that I have always said, and in many ways is true, first grade is the worst grade. If you can get past first grade, the rest is easy, including college. In the first grade, and I'm speaking from experience, a new level of discipline and expectation enters your life. You're expected to behave, to pay attention, to absorb and reflect back what the teacher is teaching. You can't just giggle your way through it because you're cute. You're graded. Performance is measured. You get report cards. And what does a first grader want more than anything in the world? To advance to second grade. So you got to do your homework. But another way, you're growing up. Mixed in there somewhere is how to begin to know that bears don't wear neckties. Of course, to understand this, it first helps to be taught this. And, Kathy, is there a way to line up the true stories from the fictional stories, just side by side? Is there a way to blend fiction with fact? All the time. Anytime I introduce children to a fiction book, I also introduce them to a nonfiction book that would help them understand the real animals that are behind the story. But would the nonfiction book be as engaging and entertaining as the fiction? I think it is after they've been introduced to the fiction story because then they're able to relate to those animals in a different way. And so the fictionalized account makes the real information come alive and they can remember those facts because of the narrative story they've been introduced to. An example is Diary of a Worm by Doreen Cronin, pictures by Harry Bliss, May 28th. Last night I went to the school dance. You put your head in, you put your head out. You do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself about. That's all we could do. (laughs) Well, because worms don't have arms and legs. And when you look in the nonfiction book, there's a page, has a picture of a real worm, and it says a worm has no eyes or ears. Its whole body can taste and it can feel light and sound, but it gives a factual depiction, but I'm going to remember that hokey pokey dance and that, okay, but you know, a worm, it's just a worm. It doesn't have arms and legs. It's building that curiosity, that inquiry, that questioning. That's just so important. And school librarians are trained to do that, to bring those examples into the school, into the classroom, into the hands of children. Great. What's next? Um, Creature Features, 25 Animals Explain Why They Look the Way They Do by Steve Jenkins and Robin Page. Kind of that hybrid book that has some aspects of fiction mixed with nonfiction, but the facts are all there and help children learn. A question a child might ask, Dear hamster, why are your cheeks so fat? And so the hamster responds, That's not fat. It's my dinner. I store seeds and nuts in my cheeks. I'll take them back to my burrow and eat them later. We have so many books at our disposal now that present 
the world of animals to children in an engaging way. One more book, one of my favorites, by Steve Jenkins called Actual Size, and in it are illustrations that help children see the actual size of different animal parts. There's a page that has the hand of a gorilla, but a child or an adult can put his or her hand on top of the gorilla's hand and see how incredibly large that gorilla's hand is compared to the child's own. And there are other examples throughout the book as well. So children can see how big an elephant's foot actually is. It's going to be hard to stand next to an elephant and put my foot next to an elephant's foot. But in a two-page spread in this very large book, I can see the size of my foot compared to the size of an elephant's. That's genius. And it's, it's so simple. It is. It seems simple, but... It's very intentional, and we have authors and illustrators today who are working hard to bring the world of nature, the world of animals, to children. We have scientists who consult on these books for children and help to make sure that the facts presented, even in a fictionalized way, help children to understand the real world around them. Give us a report card, if you will. Kathy, I'm curious, how well has the state of Kentucky, our teachers, our parents, our society, how well have we done using animals to prepare kids for future life? I think that we do a really good job here in Kentucky. I think that we have the advantage of having wonderful places in Kentucky for children to visit, the Salado Wildlife Center, programs like Kentucky Afield, and certainly through our schools where we have certified school librarians who can bring the world of nature, the world of animals to children through print and digital resources. All right, one question I always ask every guest, do you text and drive? I do not. Kathy Mansfield, thanks a million for coming by. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I had a wonderful time talking about children's books with you. It's been a good show. As a final thought, I encourage an active imagination, and reading and storytelling are excellent ways to begin. Lots of silly ideas are born there, but so are dreams. So is ambition. A healthy imagination helps us start with the end in mind. As for wildlife, I can't really imagine or don't want to imagine a world that doesn't care for our woods and our waters and our birds and animals. What it is, what it might be if we're not careful. While grown-ups see animals in their more natural place, thanks to storybooks, kids may be more likely to see them as critters that walk and talk and wear funny outfits. But if they help to teach a child a valuable lesson, then that's what brings the two worlds together. And that you can read on their faces. I would love to hear your thoughts on the subject, and you can do that on our Facebook page under Kentucky Field Radio. While you're there, I have posted the link to our guest's appearance on Wheel of Fortune. Check it out. I love a teacher who brings real-world experience to the classroom, and my guest today has been one of those. We are out of time. This is Charlie Baglin inviting you to join us in a week, and we'll go inside outdoors again on Kentucky Field Radio. Thank you.